to do some of the heavy lifting. Let me see. I think uh, paint on UV mesh is what I want. All right, cool. Um, 3D Coat and ZBrush are pretty good. I like both. If you had to just pick one, uh, I would say probably 3D Coat because you can do a lot with it. But if you have the money, I would say get ZBrush. But if you have the money even more, then get both. And once you buy them, you own them forever, which is great. Like I bought ZBrush like eight years ago. And so I've, I haven't had to, like, they keep updating and making like really good. So it's like clearly one of the greatest investments I've ever made. Uh, 3D Coat's the same way. But I bought 3D Coat like a lot later. There was a time I think it was much cheaper. So if I would have got in on that time, that would have been dope. But eh, I didn't. All right. So let's talk about materials. Okay. So let's talk about a surface that has. Uh, a diffuse sensibility that's really reflective, right? And something that's really metallic and reflective. In fact, you can have variants of this, obviously. You can have 50% uh, roughness and smoothness. So this will be, well, let's go on top and do it. So it looks something like that. You can have something that's 100% uh, rough, 100% metallic, have something like this, All right? And obviously varying degrees, All right? Okay, so I'm using the 3D software because it just makes it so much clearer to understand all this stuff. Okay, so when you have a matte material, uh, I like to try to imagine things in three categories of um, lighting or rendering or material indication rather. So the first one would be absorption. How much is the light being absorbed by the material. So in this first example, in this first example, we got, in this first example, we got um, our example one, we got pretty much 100% absorption, right? Except for the color red. That's why we're getting the red bouncing back. And then I think about ref reflection, and that's what these two do. And there's two types. So in, in two, we have reflection that mostly feels hard surface, but it's not necessarily like a plastic, or I'm sorry, not like a metal. It's like more like a plastic, maybe a ceramic or hard glass. And then we have the third one, which is really metallic looking. And that one, that one is, part of well it's probably better if i do 2a so that one's like part of reflection but it's more of a harder surface which makes it almost like a mirror okay so if you notice the reflections in two it's 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 reflective but it's not like a mirror where number two is totally a mirror with a red tint right in fact if we make this color white and we paint it like right here or like maybe right like here, it's a mirror, right? Because then white has all the colors, so all the colors are reflected. Where this is absorbing all the colors except for red, so it's shooting out a red tint of the, the environment. Does that make sense? And then there's a third variable, which I can't really do in the three software, but which is refraction. And refracting makes things see-through, like glass, like a window. And so whenever I'm painting, let me go ahead and close 3D coat. 
That's all we need it for. Um, whenever I'm painting, I'm, I'm making these choices. I'm like, okay, so this material right here is more matte, let's say. So then when it goes to the shadows, it's a lot softer. There's no reflection of any kind. It's just pretty matte. You know what I'm saying? All right, and this is also pretty matte material right here. At least for now, I'm going to make it one. But then if I make this decision, if I change my mind, if I'm like, you know what? This dark material, I wanna make it reflective. I just think about what I did there and tell them, like, okay, if this is more like a plastic, then I have to just paint in kind of a really harsh reflection. So we'll paint in like the environment. Yeah, there's like a sun. That's all part of this. And I will just like paint in the reflection of this material. And if you have different kind of forms, then it becomes, you just have to do those same materials reflected back in there. Usually light's pretty strong, right? And what I, I like to do is paint things like in that fashion. Now what I like to do on top of all of that, right? is have that contrast. So then I would make this super matte compared to this, that really reflective material. <coughs> you know? But what I tend to do is I just do shortcuts to a lot of things. So for instance, if I was going to paint a character I usually try to get into forms first. Right. And so then when I get into forms, then I'll begin to paint in different materials. But I haven't put the materials in just yet. I'm just putting them in as shapes. Keep the shadows pretty consistent. And once I have all these shapes into place and all these different materials indicated, then I will start, or materials placed, not indicated yet. Then I will come in here and start to indicate the actual materials. So a good example of this would be like these, maybe like this um, dark dark like kind of cover. So I can be like, okay, 
the light's coming from this direction because of the way I shaped all the lighting on her torso, then I would make this super reflective and just focus on the light as the thing that's reflecting. And I'm thinking about where it's reflecting. And again, this will be echoed every time there's a form change. And to add some more complexity, maybe we'll have some another light source reflecting. And the light sources don't have to be actual lights. It could just be part of the environment on the contours of this. You see how quickly I've made those different materials? You know? And so then, wait, hold on just a second. Hello? You guys still there? Yeah. Oh, sorry. My daughter came in here. She was crying about something. Told her, to get out. <laughs> uh, but this is kind of how I approach materials. I, I do it really simply. But if I really wanted this to look like a very specific material, then I get the reference out and then I'll strike to uh, make those adjustments. But just to get the first impression, this is usually what I'll do. And you can see it's pretty effective, like just thinking of it really simply, right? And so then whenever I put in um, any other material, like I'm just painting those abs first, abs are a material. Um, whenever I start into painting, like let's say I'm gonna add like a like a trim, what I like to do is like I'll, I'll draw in the trim. And then once I have that trim in, then again, I think about where the light source is at. And that's where the reflection would be. And it just makes it that much more believable. So uh, I usually keep to a few materials too. I usually just focus on relatively reflective materials to really relatively matte materials. And that works pretty well. And if I wanted to make this more metal, then I would just make it darker, but I don't know if I want to do that. All right, if you guys have any questions, feel free to ask. This pretty much concludes the material. But ho hopefully that was helpful. Was that helpful? Yeah, I mean, I found, I found it helpful. I think it was Mark who asked. Okay, great. <laughs> it doesn't matter if I found it helpful. <laughs> I don't think it matters, man, if you think it's helpful. Get out of here, Tony. <laughs> Ryan, you wrote a lot. I'm going to have to read. I left college after one semester to study on my own. I want to learn as much as I can before I get a full-time job. I'm aiming to have my portfolio done by the end of the year. <sighs> so I can start getting my first client. How do I know if I'll be ready? How should I approach getting my first job? 
I do go to industry events, but they usually only happen around August. Uh, there's usually one around all the time. There's one that's next week that I'm going to. You just got to look around. Um, the whole, uh, how do you know you're ready? Well, you're ready now. You just not, you don't have the work that's good enough to work for the companies that you would like to work for. Um, you got to keep in mind that the, the two things that you have control over is the quality of the work you have and the people you know. So the more, the better your work is, then the easier it is um, to put it in front of people, obviously. But you should always put it in front of people anyway, even if it's not as good as you think it should be, because some people don't really ever know how good they need to be anyway. But if you wanted a, an objective way of thinking about it, compare your work to your favorite artists because they're your competition. They're your fiercest competition. And if you put your work next to your favorite artist, you should immediately understand how, um, how much work you need to do, you know, to give you a good example of kind of what I, how I learned this and I learned it like really aggressively was that I was, um, I was hanging out at GDC one year and I went to apply for a job at um, Insomniac Games. And then Insomniac, they, um, they basically put, um, they, they basically put this flyer out to, that they're hiring, you know, concept artists. So I applied for the job and the guy was like, oh, sorry, we just filled the position. And I was like, oh, man. And he's like, you know, like, your work's really good, though. We, we would have totally gave you a chance, but we already uh, hired somebody. And, and I don't know if you know their name. Uh, their name is Carlo Arleno. And you might not know who that is, but I did. And Carlo Arleno was one of my teachers. So it's like if you guys applied for a job and then they said, oh, yeah, we just hired somebody. Uh, it's Anthony Jones. That's pretty much what happened. And that can happen, by the way. It's not like it won't not happen. I actually had some students apply for certain freelance gigs, and then I got approached by those same clients, and they hired me, right? And so that happens. It's not like I, I knew. I just was like, oh, yeah, got to get work. And they're like, oh, you got that job? Oh, man, I just applied for that. <laughs> and I was like, oh, I didn't know. And, but even if I didn't, it doesn't mean that they would have got the job. There might have been someone else who applied at the same caliber as me or even better, you know? And I always try to remind my students that that's true. Okay? So whenever you're trying to think of like, well, how do I know? How do I know when I'm good? Uh, you should already know where you stand, right? And in terms of ready, like get, getting a job, I think most of you guys can do it, right? Um, it's just the, the level of quality of, or the job that you can get. That's, that's the real question. You know what I mean? Thanks for the answer. Also, I, I also, may I ask which event are you going to? I happen to have a friend in Spain that might be interested. Yeah, it's called nonstop Barcelona, I think. It's my student's uh, uh, event that he hosted. He's done it for three years now. It's really great. It's gotten bigger. I think it's a part of a bigger event, but he, he now manages um, the visual development part of it, which is awesome. Heads. Heads. But any other questions, friends? Any other questions? Is it better to get a job now or just wait until we get a better portfolio? I think it's better to just uh, make a, as good of a portfolio as you can that you feel confident with and then try to get a job with that portfolio. 
because then you're most likely to get a job that you'd prefer doing. But sometimes people will build a portfolio just for the sake of having a portfolio or get a job just for the sake of getting a job and then they end up having no more time. And I don't want you guys to fall into that trap. It's, it's also another kind of trap. People say, well, once I start working, then, you know, I'll start working on the things I really like, but they actually do not find time to work on those things either. So be very, very cautious. But uh, I, I took the route of just trying to get a job. And the first job I ever had taught me a very valuable lesson that I should not just try to get the job and that I should always make a portfolio. I'm going to open up the window a little bit. Actually, hold on. I think my wife turned on the air conditioning. Yeah, because I'm cooking. How valuable do you think it is to take on a student uh, student-led game project? I'm currently designing stuff for a team like this. How would you say I can get the most out of this experience? I just want to make sure I am using my time efficiently. Just uh, try to learn from the process, like from everybody's vantage point, learn how to work with other people. That's probably the biggest thing that you can learn from those types of things. Like how to delegate and work with others is, is a skill on its own. But try to effectively design stuff that you can see that they could manage to create. Like try not to make things that are so insa insane that they're just like on paper it looks great, but then it's like really not practical or practical for those people to make. Not because um, I think that's just how it is in the industry in general. No, it's because some studios don't do that at all. And I, I have you guys for your portfolio trained to not do that because I think it's much easier. But in a small indie development or a small, you know, student project, this skill is, is a good time to practice that skill, I mean. All right. I feel like I'm alone. You guys aren't talking to me. Only Tony. But he doesn't count. <laughs> <laughs> it's all right, Tony. I still accept your friendship. You know, the other day I was listening to a guy named uh, Jordan Peterson. Do, do you guys, are you guys familiar with this guy? No, I haven't heard of him. Um, yeah, he, he's like really against like social social justice warriors. He's like a big freedom of speech um, dude. And, um, oh yeah, go for it, Ryan. Finish my story afterwards. All right, I think you're typing up. Uh, I love lots of Korean artists. Why can I tell it's Korean? Is that your question? Oh, okay. It's just like, um, it's like if you can tell, uh, where, where do you live, right? No, you don't even have to give me your address, like this, your country. Oh, Toronto. Okay, great. So in Canada, right? There are different people, right? And some of those people in Toronto speak with a certain like city accent, sounds similar to kind of like the way I sound maybe. And then some of them have more of like a French 
you know, Montreal kind of accent. But even within, let's say they all speak English, then you have people in the city who sound a certain way, people who live in the farm, people who live closer to the States. And these are all the people that speak English, okay? There's an accent to them, right? I think you understand kind of where I'm going with this, right? So that art has the same thing to it. So, so a lot of times you can tell if they're from China or Korea based off of like a very specific kind of accent that they have in their artwork, right? They have more of like a Western appeal, right? They have really strong forms and uh, they have really consistent values and materials, right? Uh, their design's a little bit more practical, but they have a, an Asian flair, like a lot of detail. You know what I mean? Their, their characters' faces look like actual faces. They're not like overly anime. But there's a sense of that there, isn't there? That's like the accent that you're picking up on. Like I could tell sometimes if someone's from Russia based off of the way they paint or the way that they design. I can tell if someone's from Korea, China, etc. Like France. You know? And it's not obviously universally true for every single person. It's just a cultural thing, right? Remember, you guys cannot put out what you don't put in. And so if you're raised in a certain culture with a certain kind of ideal and aesthetic, then that aesthetic's gonna come through in the way you talk, the way you walk, and the way you draw. Make sense? Yeah, which actually kind of segues to the, the thought that I was about to talk about with this Jordan Peterson guy. He, he um, a lot of what he has to say I agree with, but this is one of the things I strongly disagree with. Now, I'm not sure if he's like religious or not, but he made the claim that, um, or someone was making an assertion that, you know, what is there to lose if you remove uh, uh, God or religion? And he's like, kind of think about like what we would not have if we didn't have these things. And then Jordan Peterson like immediately fires off naming like, like art, poetry, li literature, narrative, all this stuff. Um, and that's just patently untrue because he was implying that because there is some sort of God, there's, there's an ability to create art and storytelling and what have you. And I mean, you just can look at all the different religions and all the religions in the past to think that religion is a product of a, a larger uh, God or some sort of being. And that because of that, we are able to create art is just false. I think it's the other way around. I think that humans find ways to, you know, reflect all of these creative tendencies because I genuinely believe that humans in general are just creative. Like, I think that's part of our genetics. And that's what allowed us to evolve in such a large capacity and build the technologies and expansions that we have. Because humans aren't really any smarter. Like you might think that we're smarter, you know, than we were, let's say, a thousand years ago. Like if you just think of, think of it on its on the surface, it may seem true. But it's not that we're smarter. It's just that we have more stuff right off the bat. Like when my dad was born, he was no less smarter than me he just didn't have the internet or cell phones or um, modern transport and refrigeration that we have it today do you understand just like my kids are going to be born with everything's a touch screen a great example is one day when my daughter went up to the tv when i had netflix on and she touched the tv to swipe it and i thought to myself yeah why isn't my tv touch screen but that's my point. She's already in a world where that's true. Does it make sense? So humans aren't entirely smarter. 
It's just that we have more advances and we piggyback off of the previous generation. We don't necessarily fabricate anything in inherently new. We just pick up from where we left off. And that has been the greatest attribution to our success is not so much that we have some sort of divine um, inner meaning. It's just that we're really good at just kind of taking people's word for it and then going with the flow, right? So for instance, if you ever got on a plane, think about how crazy that is on a survival level. You got on a plane, you don't know who's flying it. You don't know who made the plane. You don't know who's made the seats in the plane, who created the safety instructions, who um, manufactured the, or who's controlling the, the place that you're going. You don't even, um, you may have never even been to the, the location that you're about to land, right? Maybe the first time. Uh, and what's even crazier, you sit next to people, hundreds of people that you've never met in your life. And you can fall asleep in most cases like a baby. Isn't that insanity? <laughs> Isn't that like on its face, like kind of crazy? No, yeah, I would I'll definitely have to agree with that. Like, right? Like, still... like, think about that. Like, we can do stuff like that all the time, you know? Uh, and what were you going to say? Sorry, I interrupted. There's, um, at this building that I work at, right, the, the building feels like it's shaking every once in a while. And I'm always like, nobody hears the building shaking. Like, you're just going to assume that's normal. Like, well, I'm uh -huh. always, like, worried. So stuff like that, that people are like, oh, you know, someone built a building, it's going to stay up no matter what. But they don't know who built it or when they built it. This, this is the greatest, but yet the most embarrassing gift that we have as humans. Why is it great? Because then it will allow something like my daughter to be able to pick up an iPad and not know anything about it and just say, this is a device that will allow me to have access to all sorts of information and uh, be able to do things that in the past few generations were never able to even get close to doing, right? She just accepts that that's true, right? She might Snapchat or tweet or do something that's not really, you know, noble <laughs> or prestigious, but she can't. You know, and and then the 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 same that same coin on the same side uh, on the same coin, but on the other side, creates you know terrible cultures, religious like terrible religious habits, um, bad social behaviors, these types of things. Right? There's a cult that's, and you know we like to point at religion as the only place that bad ideas come from. No, no, no. Bad ideas can come from all sorts. It's just religion compounds them for they amplify them because there's a, a there's a, a higher calling that these people associate with right but but there's like this whole group of like the guy who ran over the people in toronto right he was apparently he was a part of this group who believe that there's this new problem with women who don't like give men like him a chance and there's like a whole group and he's apparently a hero amongst this group it's not like a terrorist group like any other right it's not like the he might have had other associations, but that was one of the things that he was actually a, attributed to. The I'm not getting laid club. <laughs> and we laugh, but like, that's an ideology. You know, they're taking his word for it or the people who may have convinced him, they're taking their word for it. Yeah. You see, that's, that's the double-sided edge. You know, because on the one side, it allows us to understand languages, cultures, Belief systems obey the law, right? Be trust authority, like people who are like, you know, scientists and experts of their fields. We can trust them without ever meeting them or talking to them or even seeing their research for not even a little bit, right? Mm -hmm. But that same, that same thing that drives us to fall for that will also make us fall for bad actors. And if you understand this, then you, you can understand how your own mind works. You can understand how to take advantage of that. Meaning like knowing that, hey, you know, <clears throat> because of this belief system that I used to believe that talent was a real thing, uh, I trusted that. But, you know, the evidence is saying otherwise. Because the other part of our, uh, what makes us humans great is that we have the ability to use logical, um, logical deduction right? 
we're very logically driven. We can, we can see things. We have things like foresight, which is incredibly powerful, you know? And I think the people who use logic and foresight the most uh, effectively are people who also understand their own humanity, right? And they understand their own flaws and their own weaknesses, and they can act upon those uh, objectively. And for instance, like when I t teach you guys, right, I always teach you that feeling you have of feeling really sucky is a primal problem, right? And understanding that is really powerful. And then understanding that your, your brain is really good at just taking information, information and just kind of going with the flow. Um, that's really useful if you want to trust softwares, programs, or uh, other stuff. But then you have to think, okay, but someone, like whenever I see people complain about like crashes in ZBrush or in Maya or whatever, I, I say, you know, you, you make it seem like the program is just doing something stupid, right? But the reality is that um, it could be. It could, there could be some fault, faulty programming there. But, but especially for these higher end, like most of those things are ironed out. And, and sometimes the errors and the problems aren't a, an issue with the programming it's an issue with user error, meaning that you don't understand the vision of the creators and you don't understand how they've created the pattern of systems in that software. And because you don't understand it and then you apply like a, a texture on a thing that they never foreseen, I mean, intuitively should work, but they didn't foresee this thing and they do have a solution to this problem, but not the way that you want it to be done. And because you don't see that correlation, you then will blame the software without necessarily blaming your own method, right? And once you understand like that, when things just don't work, there is something to it, a little bit more interesting. And you step, take a step back and you can learn from that mistake and you can learn how to adapt to the software. Like whenever I jump into a new software, uh, if it crashes or bugs out very consistently, then it's one of two problems that I usually say. Okay, if I'm working on this and it crashes like consecutively, again, it's one of two problems. One, there could be just bad programming. Or two, uh, the creators of the software and my own intuition are at conflict. So maybe I should just abandon this software for now until either one of those two things are rectified. Does that make sense? But I see a lot of people complain like as if I'm doing everything right. Like, fuck this software. It's most likely you're just not understanding how the tools work. It's like trying to grab a screwdriver and trying to hammer in a nail and blaming the screwdriver for not being a really good tool to hammer in a nail. Right? The reason why we can see that analogy and understand it very immediately, right? It's because the tool is very simple, right? There's not much to it. So we can immediately see, oh yeah, I get it, you know? But when you take like a really heavy software like Photoshop or any of these big softwares, right? Um, you gotta consider that you, you might just not know how things work. And it's, it's most likely true, especially if it's very popular, very big software used by many, many people. The chances are you are probably the reason why it's not working. Not so much that this software is terrible. You know? Uh, makes sense. And, and that's what I'm trying to say. Like, if you understand this, like these types of things that go through your own mind, it's a very powerful weapon. It makes you learn so much faster because you stop putting the blame on other things, right? You start to look internally and then you start to have a larger uh, perspective of the reality, right? Like when I get on the plane, and I don't question any of that stuff. That's me closing out any sense of reality. And like I said, that's a human trait that gives us a large advantage in many things, right? A monkey would never get on a plane, not because it's a stupid monkey. It's because it's a smart monkey. You get it? It's like, what in the world is on? <laughs> what the hell is that iron bird? You know what I mean? It is, it is terrified. And we still have that in us a little bit, you know? 
That's also what also makes us scared of things that we don't understand, right? But our our primate cousins, they have it like in full force. That's why they're still primates. Or I mean, we're primates too. That's why they're still, you know, the apes that are chilling in the forest, right? Yeah, I think sometimes it has to do with like just society itself, right? Like if you don't get on a plane, you feel like the backlash of someone being afraid. Oh yeah, mob mentality. Yes, you're right. I mean, that's we're social animals, so it perfectly makes sense, right? So I agree. I understand. I understand exactly what you're trying to say there. But uh, I I bring all this stuff up because I want you guys to try to, like, be more aware of that. makes you guys better artists, right? Because if you start treating art like this, some sort of divine divinity bestowed upon you by some sort of external force, uh, you're just patently wrong, (laughs) okay? You're, like, objectively incorrect, okay? It's completely and utterly a skill that can be learned and trained like any other skill. It's just a little bit more challenging because it's a skill that relies on cognitive uh, synapses. You know what I mean? Which is our brain. Basically, it's just really complex thing. You know, we still don't understand most of what's going on. Right? But it's pretty clear to me. I, I have a pretty clear idea what's going on. You know? And so I think it's really effective to kind of be t- alert to that. Um, how, can, how can we be more aware of our own mistakes or, yeah, no, our mistakes? Yeah, so that's a, that's a great question. So uh, everything that I've said was a great tool to help you, like something that you should train, right? Like a way of thinking about stuff, a little bit like out, out of body of experience type of thing, like step out of your body and ask yourself some serious questions, right? Like, okay, I suck, but is it because of personal reasons or is it because I'm unskilled? And in almost all situations, you're unskilled. But the tool that I gave earlier, I think I gave it to uh, O'Shea, was after about an hour, if you, you, you feel like you just aren't making strong progress, right? Then take a step back and ask yourself why. Like, what do you think it is? And if you still, if you don't know how to answer that or ask the right kind of question, then just look at artwork that you think your work should be like, like something close to what you want to really aim for, right? And just put it right next to it. You understand? Um, because that will give you really, <coughs> <coughs> sorry, cough from the mic. Didn't suspect the cough. That'll give you incredibly clear insight. Right, so if I grabbed, let's say this image by Sophia, no offense to Sophia, she's just at a, a, at a different stage in her career, but she's going to be a, a great example for what we're about to do here. Let's go to my, I haven't been on my art station in a while. I'm doubly busy learning programming. Um, you know, why don't we use this image? This image is pretty good. Or actually, no, no, let's use my friend's images. It's even better. So this is Belle from Beauty and the Beast. When we look at people who run in a race, right? Like the two people who are competing in a race, um, it's very clear to see who's faster, right? It's very, very clear because we we can see a comparison. There's a comparison happening. When we have one person running in a race, right? And another person is running in a race, I'm sorry, we have yourself. Let's say you're running by yourself and you run and you make a time and you take that time and then you compare it to your new time. Again, we have a comparison. We could see what we need to improve upon, see if we've improved at all, right? So whenever you're trying to, um, um, whenever you're trying to see 
well, you need to improve. You should do stuff like this very often. Take one of your favorite artists or take an artwork that's even better than you've ever think that you're able to accomplish and put it right next to what you have. And then it should be very clear, right? You should be able to see it pretty clearly. Like in this example right here between these two, between these two artists. You know what I mean? And there's lots of different things that the artists on the left can really improve upon to reach the level on the, that the artist on the right has made, right? But we should focus on one problem at a time. So maybe the first problem is anatomical structure. Let's just focus on that. And that's what that person should focus on until they have a stronger sense of anatomical structure. And then they come back and do the comparison again with their new found studies and paintings and see what else they are missing. Oh, maybe the texture, and then go work on that. Oh, the lighting, okay, work on that. Improved forms and value until one day they're not only just as good, maybe they're now even better because they've moved on to bigger and better artists, or at least in their opinion. And there comes a point where you reach a really good skill that people start, like your work is not criticized as, as much and it becomes harder to determine what, which one's better. And that's referring to like style, right? Like people then eventually have some good expertise and skill, but then they bring a style to their work. And then now it's just a matter of that then becomes subjective. You know, that then becomes someone's opinion. You know, if you prefer this artist over that artist. So for example, if we were to go <coughs> and look at someone who I think is just as good, but brings a different quality Now, if we were to compare these two arts, um, we couldn't, right? Because they're different genres. It's, then, it's like if we go back to the race analogy, it's like if we had sprinters racing against sprinters, then we can judge them accordingly. But if a sprinter runs like the 100 meter dash, and then we take that, and then we have like a, a marathon runner, and they have like a two hour marathon, or whatever is fast, I don't really know. And then we say, oh, well, he ran at two hours, so he's clearly slower. That's not. That's not useful because they're different races. Does it make sense? And I think that's important. So you have to know which lane you're in as well. Okay. Yeah, the thing you said struck me last week. I found some success in my studies and paintings. Thanks to you. Awesome. Yeah, man. Studying is like freaking powerful, dude. And I mean like, put your head in the books type studying. I don't just mean study absentmindedly. All right, guys, I'm gonna stop it here. Any last questions? Yeah, no problem. I hope everybody learned something. I'm going to bounce out of here now. Thanks again, guys. Yep. And I'll see you guys in a week from now, a week later. So next week, take the break. Try to get as much work as you guys can. Use your time effectively. Don't be like, all right, well, I'll just wait till the last weekend. Do not, when you have that conversation in your mind, say, well, I'm just going to wait till X day. Um, if it's not reasonable, if you say, like, I'll wait till like Saturday, which is this Saturday, right? Um, that's reasonable. That's like a day and a half from now. It's fine. But if you say like, I'll wait till like Wednesday of next week, that, that is bad strats. Trust me. All right. So good luck guys. Uh, keep it fancy. And I'll talk to you guys, uh, in about a week and a half from now. Laters y'all. Thank you for watching this video. I appreciate it. Please subscribe to watch more in the future. If you like the video, I would appreciate a thumbs up. If you like this content, you can go to my website, robotpencil.net, where you can find mentorships, tutorials, and a Patreon to get more exclusive content. Thanks again, and I'll see you guys in my next videos.